Paul's not pulling any punches here. And he goes on to say, and here's where the psychology comes in. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fool, and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Now, let me just say this. Verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Ladies and gentlemen, what man usually does with the revelation of God is not turn it into atheism. Our normal reaction to God's divine revelation in nature is to turn it into religion. But a religion of idolatry. Where we worship a creature rather than the Creator. And we can do it in the Christian church. When we talk about the sovereignty of God and we talk about the holiness of God and people respond and say to me, I don't believe that stuff, my God's a loving God and all that stuff. I say, are you sure your God isn't an idol? Your religion, I mean, we all have a basic propensity towards idolatry. That's where we all are coming from. If we would take these categories that Paul has used here in Romans and translate them into modern psychological nomenclature, here's what it would look like. In many views of psychoanalysis, psychiatrists and psychologists are interested in traumatic experiences and the, the damage they do to us unconsciously, to our psyche. There's constant probing into the secrets of our past to see where we experience trauma as children and how that baggage can be carried through our entire lives. For example, I may go to I may go to see a, a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist and I'm greatly distressed about something and he begins to take my family history and he, he not only listens to the words that I say, ladies and gentlemen, he pays attention to my nonverbal communication. He may ask me about my dreams, he may ask me to, uh, to take some Rorschach ink blot tests, you know, like the guy that went to the psychiatrist and he gave him all these ink blot tests and every time the guy saw an ink blot, he gave some erotic sexual explanation and finally when it was all done you know the the psychiatrist said I can see you're really hung up on on sexual imagery and he said why do you say that he said because every one of these things uh, you interpreted in a sexual manner and the guy said well you're the one that showed me all the dirty pictures <laughs> 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 and, and but but we understand that we can communicate in other ways besides words and if that psychiatrist is taking my history and he says how do you get along with your mother and I say, Mother, I always got along great with Mother. My mother and I were terrific. I love Mother with all of my heart. And every time I say, Mother, I do that, he's reading my body language is saying something exactly the opposite from my words. And the idea with repression is this. That I have a tendency as a human being, if I have a scary experience, an unpleasant experience, a traumatic experience, to try to take the memory of that and bury it as deep as possible into my subconscious. But what modern psychiatry understands is that no matter how much I seek to hold it down, to hinder it, to incarcerate it, to suppress it, or to repress it, that repressed knowledge does not annihilate the memory. It may not be in the conscious mind, but it's there. And like Freud used to say, it's like if you expelled a boy from class, from school, and once you send him out of the classroom, he runs around out in the playground and he picks up pebbles and he comes out, starts throwing little stones at the window to let everybody know he's still out there. Well, those traumatic memories that we have are like the little boy. They keep throwing stones up. And we start getting, you know, we get these uncomfortable symptoms from the past and we're not even aware why. Is it because repressed knowledge seeks to come back to the surface. 
But when it comes up, ladies and gentlemen, it comes up disguised. It'll come out in a dream, in a strange symbol, in a strange tick or gesture, because it is too scary to come out in the form it went in. And so what we do is that we bring it back out, according to modern psychiatry, in a substituted form that is less threatening. We exchange the original idea for a counterfeit. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying is the fundamental psychology of the human race with respect to God. That the scariest thing to a sinful person in all of the world is the holiness of God. And when God reveals His righteousness and His holiness to us, that is so scary to us that what we do is that we bury it as deeply as we possibly can in the depths of our psyche, but it cannot be destroyed.